Hold on, it takes a little time. In the Trenches with Ryan Roxy. Hello, everybody, and welcome to a, another live stream episode of In the Trenches with Ryan Roxy. My name is Ryan Roxy. Today is an exciting day for me. You know, I've actually wanted to talk with this guy for years because we've been sort of over the years, there's been lots of talk. Everyone thinks that that Alice Cooper alum and I all know each other and are pals and this and that and always hang out. And, it's, and a lot of the times I haven't met a lot of the band members that have been in the Alice Cooper band because he's had so many. I mean, we're lucky with the lineup that we have now is pretty consistent, but this is one of the bigger band members ever to uh, appear in the Alice Cooper uh, band. You guys all know him, uh, influenced a lot of the sound, a lot of the look of what the a Alice 80s uh, band was. So I want to welcome to In the Trenches, Mr. Kane Roberts. Welcome. There you go. I'm just going to put him on. Come on. That's you. Hey. Hey, what's happening? Hey, how's it going? Ah. I'm doing good. I, you know, same thing for me, I, I wanted to to meet uh you know everybody in the band we met a long time ago i think it was really briefly it was just like an introduction that's but, all it was you know the last time i saw you play, i said hi to, to chuck and and uh, you know i know glenn a little bit and and of course nita um but you know we didn't i didn't get to see you in in vancouver so that was the last time that we were in the same building together because everyone yeah. always thinks yeah we, but you came and checked out the show um I was mm. trying to get somewhere to say hello to you, and but but then you were backstage in a a secret backstage backstage, and you had a little powwow <laughs> with Nita Strauss, and I got a little bit yeah. like, well, I want to meet King. Where is he? And then and then by the time I went up to the bus and then came back down, there was like, oh no, he just left. And I always got that, you know, he just left. So well, that that was the day of the uh, uh, the video shoot. The video shoot was the next day, and Alice. Now, you know, I'm, I'm sitting in my hotel room. Um, I was supposed to have my guitar, gun, a gun guitar show up for the video. And the customs actually didn't let it through, believe it or not. Shocker. So I get a phone call and they, uh, it was um, Kyler. And he goes, hey, Alice would love you to sit in tonight. And I was like, whoa. You know, because that's, that's a huge deal. But I didn't have, uh, I didn't have a... Um, um, a microphone, uh, guitar. So right. it, it turned out to be a situation where I wasn't able to, and then Nita was right. going, why don't you just ask me? I would have lent you one. And I said, well, you know, I never assume, you know, I'm supposed to take some guitar, you know, so. Well, you could always but, yeah, cut I, I, my, I get to meet you. So you could have cut my flying V into some sort of gun shape. It kind of has a little bit of a rocket gun shape thing. You're trust me from now well, on. I would, have, I would have broken the neck, broken the neck off. <laughs> <laughs> Any time in the future that you come or you're we're in the same building, you're definitely coming up on stage for sure. And like I said, Great. we're awesome. here, we are here to talk about uh, the new normal, which is your last release on Frontiers Records. Uh, Alice sure. Cooper was obviously in the song uh, "Beginning of the End," as well as yep, Alyssa White from end. Arch yep. Enemy, and uh, yep. and also on that album, Nita Strauss appeared on King of the World. I didn't know that. Lizzie Hale and you wrote uh, the Lion's Share that song, so right. I want that song itself, the video beginning of the end. How did that all come about, and how did Alice Cooper end up becoming in the video? Well, I mean, you know, you know how it is. So you know, you're in the studio, and I recorded uh, a vocal that we were kind of happy about. You know, I was saying, hey, that's you know, it sounds really good. But there's certain guys, you know, like, as you know, singing is is acting as well. You've got to really feel the lyrics. You have to feel the part. I remember Desmond Child told me to read the lyrics to songs, almost like it's a script to a movie. So, um, you know, even though I was singing the song really well, I wasn't delivering it with enough power. And I thought, you know, anybody that wants to say they, they bleat false promises until you're broken, I'll cut their evil tongue. I went, eh, that's Alice Cooper. So I called him. He was in town. He came over the same day. It was just a complete sort of a miracle. And he and Cheryl showed up. Um, we left uh, almost uh, uncontrollably for about an hour. And then he went in and chord 
recorded, you know, one of the best vocals I think that I've ever heard him do. And he upgraded the song, you know, so much. I mean, just having his presence uh, on the song really changed everything. So you yeah. know about him as well. <laughs> so. I, well, I know that whatever song that you have that you've, you you might write naked on your couch or you're sitting in your robe like you are and you're just jamming and it becomes a riff yeah. and maybe it becomes a song. It's it the second you give it to Alice and he puts a vocal on it or changes a word here or there, then it becomes an Alice Cooper song. And it's an Alice Cooper song from there and on out, right? Yeah. Yeah, and, and it's like these other planets get attached to the song as well. These, these entire, like, these cults, you know, these whole worlds that uh, he's lived through, he really is, you can hear it in his voice and how he, how he delivers different lines. He's pretty, he's pretty amazing guy, so. So you, know. you, had, you had this, uh, this record, uh, The New Normal. Uh, it comes out, you have all-star cast with Alice in the video. You have uh, Alyssa from Arch Enemy in, in the video which, as well. Um, were you thinking that maybe this year you would have been touring that and then all of a sudden it, things got a little bit derailed? You mean, did I want to tour the, the album? I, yeah, I was thinking that my, you might perhaps be on tour sometime in 2020, but oh, wait no. a second, the world changed. Yeah, see, like, I'm a little bit, uh, you know, my whole feeling about uh, touring is a little, little different. So uh, I, I'm more, I, I think I'm going to be, as an artist, I would like to be a little bit more video centric, if you know what I mean. Like, I think I can reach a lot more people than I w would otherwise if I was, in, let's say, you know, touring clubs in the U.S., you know, uh, some of my friends who play with, you know, massive bands, you know, I, I, you know, I won't mention any names, but I mean, they do clubs and there's 20 people there. So I, I feel, uh, you know, when I made that uh, al album, that, that CD, I thought to myself, um, I want to, uh, I want to do videos. So I have uh, three more videos ready to go off of the record. Um, you know, my, my relationship with frontiers, uh, you know, completely exploded. But, but, you know, the, those guys, Mario and Serafino are, um, uh, are pretty amazing, you know, so be, because they're the real deal. They're guys that were in their apartment and they wanted to keep uh, hard rock and heavy metal just be viable. And they ended up uh, with their record company, you know, and they have a very hard coded uh, business model, hard coded uh, business model. But, um, but, you know, I love those guys. I, I just really admire them. But, you know, okay. that, that the relationship, I'm, I'm, I'm just I'm kind of tough to work with sometimes, especially with, uh, from the business side, you know, just because, uh, you know, I, I don't agree with how a lot of it's handled. So, um, uh, but wow. yeah, so, so what I've done on my own is finance, you know, three more videos, uh, you know, beyond the beginning of the end. I have a director's cut coming out. I have a video about uh, domestic violence. And then finally, uh, my last video is just going to be kind of psychotic with a, uh, celebrity sort of in at the front of it so it should be fun yeah well here's the thing i i think you might be ahead of the curve of where we're at right now it might be serendipity i don't know yeah. but because of our stage that i'm used to playing on and alice is used to playing on you're used to playing on in front of people is sort of temporarily taken away i think video is going to come back on the forefront and it's going to take a lot more imagination and people that are promoting their music through videos and it seems like you've already made that because you you know you're a smart business guy you've you've done it on your own you've um you know when you mentioned club tours and big names pulling in 20 people you can say ryan roxy you can you can say my solo name it's okay <laughs> I'm, I'm used to playing uh clubs you know, what happened it happened to me yeah yeah so, so we and, know, and, you know how hard um, it is Go ahead. You go ahead. Go ahead. What you? <laughs> okay. Well, I was going to say is, um, you know, the industry, the way things have changed right now, everything's, uh, you know, on its ass. Uh, what's go the the process will be normal. In other words, some of the promoters, let's say, even guys that do huge huge festivals in Europe or whatever, they're going to go down. But there will be a businessman who will say, "Hey, I can get this for cheap." It's almost like a fire sale, and uh, They'll take up, you know, that guy's business and then they'll find a way to get people into these venues. They'll rip off the artist, just like every other business model. And, and everything will be back to, quote unquote, uh, semi-normal. 
Um, <laughs> there's going to be changes. I don't know exactly what they're going to be, but it doesn't matter what your job is. There's going to be changes to it. And, and I think that the complex part about the you know economy coming back, it's not a normal thing because there's a this layer of this, this virus uh, crap on top of it. So, but, right. you know, in terms of, of, of artists, you know, this is when people invent, just like you said. And I think you you have a, a thing that you recorded that's for live streaming, and and I have one coming up uh, with with somebody. As soon as it gets real, I'll uh, I'll let you know first. Um, and you know, it's going to be it's 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 kind of exciting in a way. This is a depressing time if you just look at it as like a depressing time. You know, a good time to invent something and come up with you know your own method of of getting your music uh, out so that people can hear it and people can get to know it, like the show. Typical. It's good. Perhaps it's time that musicians can take, and you're really interesting me right now with what you're saying. It's very interesting is that perhaps now is the time that musicians can take a little bit more control back into their corner and make a, take a little bit of control and be able to uh, dictate a little bit more how they want their career sort of presented and i think you're on your way to doing that right yeah well that they they have musicians just in general i mean occasionally i do i did some seminars with music and it'd be a lot of young people there and everybody's like you know uh, you know should i go into the music industry what it's like we well, never really want to safely advise somebody to get into the music industry right and I, you know because uh, uh it's rough you know so you have to have that thing and i'm sure you possess it Everybody tells you, no, you're going to fail. There's a million people right now trying to do what you do. Why do you think you're going to succeed? You hear it all the time. And people hear it what, you know, all through their lives. If there'll be some you know, kid ready to go to college and he wants to paint and you know, his, everybody tells him, what are you fucking kidding? You know, and, and so they talk him out of it. There's certain part of musicians that are too stupid to listen. And we just keep moving forward and try to, uh, and try to create something so that uh, people can hear. But, you know, in terms of like how to profit off the industry, you got to understand how it started. You know, musicians back in the day used to stand on the side of the road with uh, little shoes that curled up with a bell and have a mandolin and rich people like drove by in carts and threw meat at them. But it's still the same, it, it, you know, in a way. I mean, they're not throwing meat. Maybe they're throwing tomatoes. I don't know. But, but well, at a wasp. It's, it's, in other words, it's. Yeah. And so it's <laughs> it's a rough situation to be in. But once you make the, decide, the decision, then you know, what you want in life, your real job is to wake up happy every day. So if you say, you know, I think it's going to make me happy is if I play music, you got to come up with something. You got to fucking invent something. If you can't play live anymore, it's up to you to come up with something new. Because if you wait for the corporations to do it, and by the way, people are going to start improving all the streaming software and all that stuff. If Absolutely. you wait for a corporation to fix things, uh, you're going to get ripped off like than uh, you can possibly imagine. So... Yeah, you were a little bit uh, perceptive in the fact that you joined the Alice Cooper band in 85. You played on three of his most popular records in the 80s. Um, you had a big, yeah, uh, obviously a big influence on the way the band image was. But then you yep. didn't play for a long time. You made, and then you made some solo records, but then you took sort of a hiatus and that's when you got more in studied and got into technology. I'm, I'm going to go back to the eighties in a second, but I want to talk a little bit more about what you're saying. Cause you actually studied technology, you studied graphics, computer graphics, computer programming, and you saw all this happening, you know, in the forefront. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, well, you know, through history, technology comes in and cuts the legs off uh, off of industries. Like, look at the printing industry. So, you know, these people had these little mom and pop shops. Suddenly, Hewlett Packard comes out with a hundred dollar printer, and all of those businesses are are pretty oh. much you know destroyed unless they move into whatever technology is allowing you know Hewlett Packard to do that, and they have their own sort of a new setup for their business. Um, in terms of the opportunity, the place that we're at in now, you can look at it like an opportunity if you can get at the forefront on how to either monetize uh, doing live streaming stuff or just doing it just to get your music out there and like increase your brand a little bit. So, yeah, you know, we're stuck in our places. 
you know, I'm not, I'm not an obeyer. I, I don't, I don't, I don't like it. I still go out. I still do stuff. I, you know, it's tough for me to, to just sort of hunker down, but you know, you know, it's a real situation. So, you know, we have to deal with it. I know people that are experiencing tremendous uh, anxiety over it, but I always say, you know, maybe my best stuff that I, I ever best guitar playing I ever did was I, my life just felt like it just suddenly got wrecked, you know? Um, uh, you know, I was, uh, either broke up with some girl that, uh, you know, uh, I felt I could never live with or whatever. And suddenly I'm sitting there and I'm practicing guitar all day and I'm playing a song. And, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things where as a musician, you have to absorb hardship as well as the good times as well. And, you know, certainly, you know, we're going to, we're going to know some hardship in terms of, you know, I mean, my, my clubs, the, the clubs I used to play in when I was, uh, uh when I was a, a kid, we're like, uh, it would be like a strip club on rock night, you know, right. and we would make at the end of the, do the door and into the night, I'd get $11 and 87 cents. And, you know, I don't know Good if you ever, I ever told you, <laughs> I guess I couldn't, but, but I used to, uh, to make money, I used to deal cards at this illegal uh, blackjack game in, in Manhattan. So we would go from hotel conference room to hotel conference room, you know, every weekend. And so I would do a show and I'd go in there and I'd deal blackjack and I'd make, you know, maybe 800 bucks with tips and everything. You know, I'd walk in and the guy would show me where all the guns were. I mean, it was like this was how I was going to survive. I certainly wasn't going to survive by strapping on the guitar and, and singing originals at, at some strip club. So, you know, that's the war that you get into. But, you know, you, you look at you look at a lot of industry. What was that guy? Uh, Jeff Bezos, who made one of the most incredible companies in the world. I saw a picture of him in his first office. And it looks like, you know, my, my office when it's a complex, you know. Oh, it looks so, like my room uh, right now. So, yeah, you know, I know. You can just see. I've seen that. You just got to start. You got to do what you got to do. The, the point is, you know, having the idea is one thing. Making the idea take place is end zone. And that's what we should all be shooting for, no matter what uh, sort of crap the government throws at us, you know. Damn. You're giving good advice, Kane. This is good. And, it, and everyone told me that, you know what, he's smart. And he's funny and he can fucking play guitar. So that's yeah. what I want to get into a little bit more about the guitar playing because you joined, you joined Alice in 85 before that, had you been in a bunch of different bands or did Alice pluck you from obscurity? How did, how did that whole audition? Because I know that for me, I went down and auditioned. Eric Singer was on drums. Bob Daisley was on bass and Alice Cooper was actually in the room. Now, how did your audition go down? Yeah. Well, mine was a little little different. Um, I had uh, sent my tape, I think it was a cassette tape, to um, this guy Don Passione at his publishing company called Screen Gems. Because, you know, I was sneaking in the studio for free late at night with a, an engineer, and I would record all these demos, and then somebody said, you know, has anybody heard them? And I said, no. I mean, I, I was wondering why I didn't have a record deal. And, and I was just sitting on these tapes. So I, I sent them everywhere. This one guy calls me back and he said, I sent your tape to Bob Ezrin and he'd like you to come in and meet him. I didn't know that Alice actually came to a club uh, once and, and saw me play. So he sort of snuck in. I don't know how he, he pulled that off. And he was there very briefly, but he saw me play. So I drove down to uh, Manhattan and uh, went in there and I met, uh, you know, Ezrin. Ezrin had me in this uh, in this office where um, there's a big, big picture, big window behind him. And you can see the uh, New York skyline, you know, right. and his chair is a big old desk. And my seat was like a lawn chair. I swear to God, I was like. Oh, like by I, design, I was like two feet tall. Look, that's up. very Bob Ezra. He was by doing design. the Wizard of Oz. Oh yeah, and he goes, Kane. It was an echo. He said, "We come here tonight, tonight." <laughs> no, no, I'm kidding. But he goes, he goes, uh, Kane. Um, you are fifty percent of a great writing team. And I went, oh boy, I'm getting the shit kicked out of me already. Here we go. <laughs> and then he said, "So that to prep me for what was to come." And I go into the next room, and it's Shep, Johnny Podell. Uh, you know, all these people and Alice Cooper and I'm looking and I'm saying, these are people that change culture. They change the world. They're, they're just really movers and shakers beyond. I mean, Shep has done so many things that people are aware of. And uh, with all that stuff going on and, you know, I don't really get nervous in those situations, but you know, the, the struck of it is very evident. 
And um, Alice and I became best friends in the midst of all of it. We, we shut all the noise out and we became best friends that day. And we actually drove to a studio and a hotel and hung out for four or five days and did some writing wow. and things. So, so that's kind of how it started. I, I know that he was concerned at the time coming out of rehab, like a very, very harsh rehab where they didn't want somebody who's going to, you know, pull out drugs or drugs or whatever. So right. I was I perfect that. in, in that light to the management because, you know, I was, you know, into this whole, I was just starting to do this, this bodybuilding thing. So I was, I was, I was lifting a lot, but I hadn't gone to California and gotten serious with it yet. So, but, um, but they could see that I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to, you know, pull any sort of, uh, uh, in, in, in something unexpected and, you know, pull out a point or whatever and offer it to yeah. them. So I think that helped as well. And you never got Alice on any steroids. Did, did he ever want to get, get in on the way? I did. I shot steroids into his eye when he was sleeping. I, <laughs> it didn't seem to stick for some reason. That's why. That's no, why. I mean, you know, people ask me, like, oh, James, you do steroids. Well, you know, try going into the gym with Arnold Schwarzenegger and Corey right. Everson. And, you know, my, my training partners were Bertle Fox and Tony Pearson, these huge guys. And, uh, you know, so I started dabbling in it. I definitely took steroids. I mean, I'm not doing it now, but uh, I did it for a little bit. And, I, you know, I went from something like 179 to like 230 pounds. You know, that's a lot of steak, you know. Yeah, like yeah, some, yeah. some of those photos I see of myself, I go, what the fuck? So, uh, <laughs> well, but, you know, I, I ended up uh, you know, dropping it. I told someone that I was going to, like, judging from those early 80s pictures, I said I was some at one point I was going to have to interview one of your veins you know, and just get the get the inside scoop on one just one of your arm veins, and you know, see that that would have an interview yeah. in itself. But you no, know, my arm veins are like got really vascular. You know, I, there was some knucklehead uh, on blabbermouth, which is like you know, I walk into there, everybody's like kicking my ass, hey, fuck you. But um, <laughs> somebody said, oh man, he's got varicose ve varicose veins. I was going, no, don't you know? No, it's like, they're geez, sexy. Like, Step off. <laughs> Dude, I, I, I love my What's veiny that? arms. I, I've always had veiny arms. It's one of my, one of my, you know, I don't have the, the, the size, the bulk, but the, the, the veins are actually, well, there it is. That's, that's me as Nita Strauss before Nita Strauss, if you can see. Yep. <laughs> but I, oh, I think what, <laughs> one of the questions, uh, you know, one of the, one of the things was probably like, how do you not do steroids back in those days? If you're next, you know, side by side with Arnold Schwarzenegger. And I can see that the audition itself what process was different. But what we have in common, I think, is that my first time playing on stage with Alice Cooper, we were recording a VH1 special in Cabo. It was it became an album called Fistful of Alice. And I think the first time you ever played a live show with Alice, wasn't that a video or in some sort of live home video? We we did a we did dress rehearsals. Um I didn't. It's really I didn't funny. Uh, you know, it was, but a very, 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 very famous R&B singer uh, saw me at uh, Pep's office, and the guy fell in love with me. So, you know, I didn't know this, but 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 I'm we're doing the, the at Fox Studios, we're playing, and this guy shows up, and I, I go, what the fuck is he doing there, here, you know? And he had I know a, who it is. I can of, guess. Uh, Kentucky. Yeah, you okay. can guess who it is. So I can guess it is because I've done the math. I can do the chicken. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he brought a Kentucky Fried Chicken, and he was wearing a limo hat. And somebody said that he just wanted to see me. I, you know, I never spoke with the guy, but I was like, oh, Jesus. You know, and Shep, <laughs> Shep said, you know, he's he's kind of on a different team. But, you know, so not, yeah. not that there's anything wrong with it. I'm oh. just saying, uh, uh, you know, that was happening. But, yeah, I mean uh, – Putting the, the shows together with Alice, I mean, I know it's really because he's very open. He lets the bands create. I mean, do you find that, like you're able to develop your art? You're able to develop the sound and Glenn and everybody. Is that correct? Or That is totally correct. And the thing that I like most about it is that Alice will always give you a spotlight because he's so confident in his own ego he's so good in his own skin that he always shares the spotlight and shares and puts the ideas for everyone to contribute yeah 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 that's what it is and you know uh very few artists have that kind of con uh, uh, uh confidence i remember 
we came out, our first big show, our first real show was Joe Lewis Arena. Yeah, Halloween cool. Night, Detroit. which is a big event uh, for Alice. Yep. And um, Detroit. Uh, 20, 30,000 people. I'm, I'm not sure what it was. And, you know, the band is nervous. And they're being it's being filmed and recorded and broadcast live on MTV. Basically our first show. Yeah. So, you know, the band is backstage, definitely very wide-eyed and hyperventilating. So, you know, uh, you can we, we heard uh, Paul was up on stage, up on the riser, and he plays the first notes to Welcome to My Nightmare. And, and, you know, this, this, this deep, dark chord that we have, it's like, brrr, and smoke starts rising on the stage. And the crowd goes absolutely crazy. And this is the first time everybody in the band experienced an audience like that. Right. We had all played clubs. I mean, we'd done some big shit, you know, but nothing, nothing like this. So, you know, that sort of uh, got us a little bit more tense. And so then um, we hear, you know, Alice go, welcome to my nightmare. And the whole place explodes. Wow. And uh, yeah. so what, uh, what Alice and I decided to do was make them think it's the classic, the classic arrangement. And then right before he, uh, he explodes on the stage and kicks them that gate, we just go into a heavy, heavy metal version of it. And so uh, when Alice hit the stage, the band just completely relaxed because he yeah. had the whole thing covered. He hadn't, he had never done a show straight where he wasn't gay. No, no, I'm kidding. He had never done, <laughs> done a show straight where he wasn't high somehow. Yeah, where he wasn't you know? so, Yeah. So, you know, it, but he just completely, he just completely took over. And, we, and I was looking at him going, he's, he's reaching the last person uh, way up into the uh, bleachers there, you know. So, oh. um, but that's how, that's how we got started. And Alice and I's plan was to not look as if he survived rehab. Uh, we wanted no. it to have a nuclear version of him come back. So, yeah. Right. This is the creation that happened. Um, yeah, I mean, we both got yeah. to experience sort of sober Alice. And I've and every year that goes by, you know, he, he tends to get better with time. It's almost like wine. Um, but I do remember going back when I first joined the band in 96, learning a lot of these arrangements. They were, they were sort of, every arrangement of every band sort of, carries on and the torch is passed on and so you learn the previous band's arrangements but you guys had changed it in the 80s to a much heavier sound much yeah. more what it, what was in vogue at that time so by the time we got to the aughts and i just learned that word aughts by the way folks the early 2000s there was a complete reset by bob ezrin to go back to the original band's arrangements so at this sure. point they evolved 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 then we had a complete reboot and now we've been sticking more to the traditional arrangements but even that being said alice likes to take us he loves uh what do you call those things uh take a little bit of this song a little bit of that song and make it into a what's the word what a mashup kind of a thing yeah but but you know he, he um there's I, I don't know why I'm drawing a blank right now, but it's it's, it's like I'm I'm not a melody. Gosh darn it! Um, when when the couple like songs a are a montage yeah, of different medley. Yes. Yes. medley. medley. I swear to God, the words medley. See my finger? That means med you know. I'm kidding, yes. but no medley. Yeah, I think that's what we were trying to say. <laughs> and he's the king of the medley. So we've we've been able to morph our songs now into that. We actually have some songs in this year's set that we would have been on playing on stage and maybe we'll still be playing them at the at, at the end of the year on these shows that are from your era on the albums that you played on um we definitely do songs from constrictor raise your fist and yell and trash but the one i was thinking of yeah. i think tommy and i challenged you to it i don't know if you ever saw our, our yeah, challenge no, i saw that you guys it really, you guys are playing it great. I, I just, I was sitting there going like, what am I going to do? And then the next thing I would do is, uh, you know, just from my nature is I would, you know, be shredding all over the place. And, and I'd be like, you know, what the fuck are you doing? And, but I listened to your version and I, I saw it live. You know, I think it was one of the first times you played it in Vancouver. I'm not sure, but I, I just was, I was like just it. kicking <laughs> such heavy ass. So good, you know? 
So I, I don't, I don't know what I think I comment that now you guys got this. You don't need me. You're, you're totally doing it right now. Some of the, some of the voicings and some of the stuff that we were doing was, was a little bit, you know, a, a tiny bit different, but you know, in terms of, you know, delivering the song and, and playing with that kind of power and Glenn playing, you know, Ken, Ken Mary's drums on that are, are unbelievable. You guys like, completely smoked the song. I, I didn't feel, I didn't feel there was one bit of energy lost in any way. And especially even with your, you know, the techniques that you guys do, it's unbelievable. It's awesome. Well, the, thank you very much for that. The, the, the song in question folks listening is uh, roses on white lace. And um, I know that Nita, yeah. when you, when you talk about uh, shredders and it's Nita's like our, our designated shredder. So she, anytime a Kane Roberts era song comes up in the uh, set list Nita is chomping at the bit, you know. We we've done uh, "World Needs Guts" as well, and so yeah. it was a, a oh, cool that's, transition that's awesome. for you to go from those early '80s, which was more of a new wave type of Alice sound, to now it's becoming yeah. more of that heavy, you know, heavy it's a metal. Plan. Yeah. Ahead. Well, I mean, the whole time I was trying to change the sound, I, I heard the same thing from Ezra and from everybody. You know, got to do the classic. And, and I just basically said, you know, with Ozzy out there and with 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 who you're going to compete with, um, you know, uh, by the way, a girl named Suzanne said she learned Roses on White Lace. So you should ask her. Officer Burkholder, <laughs> we know her well. I know. I, I, that's all you had to say. Yeah. We know we know the officer. No, no, but, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I just think, uh, you know, like I said, you know, Alice's histoire is like, I thought the biggest danger would be if he went to, uh, sounded like an oldies but goodies band. Because, you know, like I understand, you know, what happens. But, you know, one guy made a comment once on one of our performances, I think it was at Wembley. And he said, with, you know, and he was one of those guys that's fully, you know, entrenched in the original lineup, which is totally understandable. I mean, anytime you see a band and you fall in love with the original lineup, one guy changes and, you know, you're trying to you're trying to get with it a bit. A few bands have been able to do that. I think Bon Jovi's doing it really well with Phil X, who's one of my one of the a really great guitar player. Absolutely. Obviously, the Stones made some changes and survived. You know, Brian Jones was, was, yeah. was one of the huge guys for me when I was a kid. So, so you know, they, they would see... Uh, they would see the band the way it was now. And this one guy wrote, Alice runs the risk of doing a tribute band for himself. And, you know, I always thought that that was actually, uh, you know, a, a very cogent statement. You have to you have to come in with something, you know, a little bit extra. You know, that's why I always felt like, uh, you know, doing this metal version of all the songs and making the arrangements different and the show a little bit more bloody. Rare Your Fist and Yell was banned. You know, all over the place, you know, Germany and, and England, you know, we finally got in there, but we'd have to change the show. So, so uh -huh. uh, I just thought, you know, Alice needed an incredible amount of edge, which he's absolutely owns, you know, so, uh, so that's how it happened. But I mean, I was hearing the same thing, you know, you'd hear from Ezra and, you know, we gotta, we gotta go back to, you know, the, the 70 sound and, you know, everybody always mentions MC5. I'm, I'm sure you've heard, you know, we MC5 just we just toured with him. Yeah, we yeah, absolutely. That is an influence. Yeah, but yeah. So, so, but you've but, created your own. You created but the a, thing is an era. Go ahead. Go ahead. You created an era What's with that? Alice. You created an '80s era with Alice that that is very important to the entire Alice Cooper legacy because people do come for the '70s yeah. songs. They come for the '80s songs. They 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 like the sort of return to the garage with the albums of Eyes and Alice Cooper and Dirty Diamonds, and and then who knows what's coming up in the future? Because Alice always seems to be reinventing himself. Because no matter what it is, you know, no matter what we do, you know, as as his band, Alice will deliver. I mean, he, if if Shep says we're going to try it this way, Alice would would kill it. You know, so so you know, it, it takes a lot of pressure off of, off of us. You know, uh, uh, you know, I I learned so much just from watching Alice on stage, and you know, I I remember uh, you know when I was in New York, I I thought I was like unbelievable guitar player I thought, oh I'm the, I'm the shit you know so i, I moved to uh, la and there's so many amazing guitar players around bashing me on the head Les pauls oh, and 
everything. So I just, I got a fucking crap. And, and, you know, I was bringing myself up along while I was watching Alice. I would say I became sort of really engaged as, as a musician and a professional after the first tour because of him. You know, he's, he's the one that, uh, I mean, I could, I could do all these metal arrangements. I could do all this stuff. You know, of course he was involved in all of it. Um, but it would all be awful uh, without him, you know, at the front of it, you know, making my, my ideas work because that, that's, that's what he does. So. Well, you mentioned all these great guitar players. Obviously, Phil X, he's been on In the Trenches as well. Uh, at that time, there's, at, at yeah. that time in that era, there's so many great shredders out there. Uh, there's so many great guitarists out there. But when did you decide that you needed to have a gun on stage? You know, at what? It, well, I, I was, we hadn't done a tour yet. And I was hanging out at uh, Shep Gordon's uh, management company. You know, they manage Alice as well. He, he yeah. managed manage me. So I used to hang around at the uh, office because uh, I read, basically had nothing to do. I was just kind of a, I, I moved from New York. Um, I'll never forget. Uh, I, when I first came here to go and write with Alice, when I first came to California, Right. Um, you know, the night before I've been playing one of the gigs, you know, I, it was like some, you know, real kind of a, uh, uh, a dungeon somewhere in Manhattan, you know? So, right. um, suddenly I'm in Beverly Hills at this mansion and there's this incredible pool, you know, and, and just a beautiful place, you know, I'm at chef's place and, uh, he came out and I had never met him. He said, Hey, Kay, how you doing? I said, oh, you know, That's doing really up. good. Hey, thanks, man. I was very nervous. I'm really fucking nervous. So, you know, he pulls out a joint and he goes, you want to hit? And I went, yeah. You know, and I hadn't smoked weed since I was like two. No, no, no. Since I was in high school. Okay. <laughs> right. And this was like weed had come a long way. And he had this Maui stuff that was like killer. So I took, I got one hit and I went, Phew. right. And I gave it back to him because, you know, I had to be a little careful. I was so fucked up. I didn't know where I was. I walked over to the pool. It was February, right? So it wasn't heated. So it was still cold at night. The, the pool was like like an ice rink without ice. And I jumped in. I was at the bottom of the pool, like screaming because it was so fucking cold, you know? I was like, I, I climbed out of there. Like, I got to get my shit together. So I just stayed by the pool until I came down a little bit. So... I thought the, the, yeah. that idea gave you the the idea for the machine gun guitar. <laughs> that was a good segue. Oh, sorry. I, I, uh, so I was so stoned, I got a gun, and I put string. No, no. Um, so I was at uh, a place at, at a live, right? right. And uh, uh, this kid comes in. This kid named Rick Johnson. Kid must have been nineteen, and he goes. Uh, he goes, I just want to see if you'd be interested in guitar. And so I said, okay, well, let me see it. And I open it. He pulls out this massive anvil case. The thing is huge. And he opens it up. And um, this incredible looking gun guitar. I was looking at it going, dude, that design. And he goes, well, you know, I'm an army brat. My dad's a general and something, you know. So he's around guns all of his life. And he made this, this guitar. So... You know, we go out back behind uh, the office there and, you know, I pulled the trigger and shot the thing up and it explodes. And this guy came down in a parachute and I said, well, I don't, I don't think we need that. Okay. But see, for me, I didn't I wasn't going to do it because I was thinking to myself, guitar can't play well. And I plugged it in. It, it's got to be one of the best playing guitars I've ever had. I always look forward to that. So, um so, yeah. And, and then, uh, you know, I, I, you know, at that same rehearsal session uh, at Fox, um, he said he put in a new charge. So I thought it was just a flame. OK. And uh, so I said, OK, so we went in the parking lot and I shot it. It's shooting flame. And this uh, Roman candle thing shoots out and goes in a window <laughs> like in this building. I said, oh, fuck. You know, so we just ran inside. We didn't burn the place down, unfortunately. So. Uh, but that's where it came from, this this kid. And, of course, you know, Shep is just really spotting something and thinking, you know, this is going to work very well. And I have to tell you, Brian, I had no idea 
that I looked anything like Rambo. I have to be honest with it. Like when, <laughs> that was when not Alice contrived. And I, that was when Alice and I were in the bus. Uh, I remember he said, uh, he said, um, uh, you know, I was looking at it, it was Cream Magazine. I don't know if you remember that. And of course, and they said, well, Kane Roberts, un, 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 underrated, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, there, and he said, we were hoping to see more of Kane Rambo Roberts. And I went, Where the fuck they getting that? And Alice went, have you looked in the mirror lately? You know, <laughs> so I remember I was looking at myself. All I need is a headband, you know, and so that stuck with me for some reason. But, you know, later. I did lunch for Sylvester Stallone, so I got to tell him that. That's great. That's great. But th th it is kind of strange that that becomes your a signature part of the look, and it comes. It almost becomes sort of like a look of the of the era of Alice Cooper. Everyone goes, oh, because you know, everyone everyone joins the Alice Cooper band is usually like the people that come up to you and say, well, you know, Glenn and Michael, those are the best guys ever. And they are because they wrote all those classic riffs and they're the, they're part of the original band. But then the second question is always, you're not the guy with the gun guitar. I go, look at me. Have you ever look at, just take a look. I have, and then this is the time I have blonde dreadlocks. Um, yeah. My arms are about the size of your wrist and basically, yeah, I didn't have a gun, but at the same time, I did end up getting my little signature piece. It's the red, white, and blue wristband that I wear. It's a lot less uh, uh, cumbersome, and it's much easier to get through customs, especially, yeah, you know. Guitar. <laughs> <laughs> but that being said, I know that, that that guitar was going to be in the... Uh, in the video that you were that you were playing with uh, with the new normal on the uh, beginning of the end video, but you, everyone knows you as a guitar player for Alice, but not a lot of people. Well, I would say not not everybody knows you as good a vocalist as you are because you've made like six solo records yeah. at this point where you're singing six. Yeah, no, I, I made like I, I did the um I did the MC record which was definitely I did it with Michael Wagner and you know that was a learning experience uh, for me um you know uh see the thing too is I, you know without I can't talk about that without mentioning how the, the industry has changed because my original record deal was for a quarter of a million dollars and I was completely unknown and uh you know and it had videos attached to it and you know I ended up working with Wayne Isham as a director and you know, I had all, all this stuff going on, and it just shows you that today, <clears throat> the average musician, especially, uh, you know, if it's not rap, rap, you can definitely get, uh, you know, half a million dollars as an unknown artist these days. If you're doing rock or metal or any of that stuff, you know, your budgets are going to be 10 grand. Sometimes people get offered five grand or 20 Happy grand. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, yeah. it's, it's just because culture has, has changed. And, and, you know, it was, it was a very proactive agenda to change everything. It is what it is. Europe, it's not so much like that. But you just see the difference in terms of the excesses that the record companies exercised. I mean, they gave you the Shep, got that much money on my first record deal. And, and I did have videos that I could do after that and all that stuff. Today, you're pretty much on your own. And, and going back to what you said earlier, you know, with current situation, I really believe that it is an opportunity for people. It's, it's an opportunity because the amount of reach you can get through the social networks and through you know, YouTube is, is very deep. Uh, as long as, you know, m my truest belief about, you know, uh, the entertainment industry success in, in, in any uh, industry is if you work really hard and you believe and you just make yourself the best you can, the world in some uh, way will beat a path to your door. And so Great. I'm living proof of that. Back, background at the way I looked, no one <laughs> would hire me ever. <laughs> Cooper, he's the only guy. And you know, since then, I've never gotten an offer to play or do anything. Now I always say my excuse is I don't suck. It's because of the way I look. But seriously, uh, you know, it, it, it just proves that if you commit to something heavy and you get obsessed, I have always said to, you know, people that, that want any kind of advice from, I don't know why they would, is that obsession is a good thing. Stuff gets burned up. You lose friends. You might lose a relationship. You got to make sure you don't lose your cat. But uh, uh, obsession can be a great thing. Um, and, and, you know, I, and I look at people like you, for example, you get an idea to do a show. 
a podcast, an interview right. show, whatever it is, and live stream it and all that. You know, when you end zone that thing, it means that you conjured something in your imagination and then it manifests in the real world. And that's the real reward of all this stuff. And we have so much time at home right now. It might be a good time for people to maybe start, you know, write a script, a book, you know, whatever it is that they feel they, they never had time to do. So the thing I'm getting more inspired by just by listening to you talk is that, yes, I do have a show. And yes, we could just sit around and bullshit about the old and glory days about Alice Cooper and your career and what you're going on to doing now. But what's really interesting uh, to me is you have some really great philosophy about the business. You have some really good ideas about how you as a musician could stand up on your own. And that's what I would like this show to sort of evolve into maybe giving other musicians that are uh, not at the position of where you're at right now, giving them some good insight and how they could do it themselves. So I actually, I have to actually invite you back for a part two where we actually concentrate a little bit more, a little bullshit, but but some business stuff, because I would love to have you on more. I, I just wanted to say one thing about your solo records because it was the Saints and Sinners album. I think you'd collaborated with Desmond Child a lot on that. He was a great songwriter for those of you that don't know about uh, Desmond Child. Desmond, he wrote, yeah. he wrote yeah. Poison. You, you, uh, my my buddy Earl Skakel, he's a, a comedian. He wanted me to ask you about uh, yeah. playing with the drummer Myram Grombacher, who's one of my favorite drummers, other than Glenn Sobel, oh, yeah. but of Pat Benatar's band, Myron, did he play on yeah, that album? Was, and what was that experience? Fight during that. Myron's kind of a badass, so we almost we almost went to uh, blows. Uh, you know, at the end, we were very friendly and very happy and all that stuff. But I remember he burst into this room, <laughs> and we were sort of yelling at each other. Everybody thought we were going to go at it. So, But, you know, uh, great drummer, played so incredible, and he was so responsible for Pat Benatar's uh, success as well. So, um yeah, so I, yeah, I'd love to come back, back, Ryan. This has been a lot. Well, oh boy, I don't want to get you doubt now. I don't want you going because we had the, we 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 might have we might pull a Michael DeBars. Hold Am on, back? yeah, you're back, bud. It's okay. Uh, That's what, wait, what I'm trying to do I'm now. now. Yeah, there we go. Perfect. What I want to do right now is before uh, we cut off. Hey, I think I'm starting to see a pattern here. What happens at about one, uh, about about 47 minutes. It's okay. It's okay. I want to, uh, if we do have to go and you have to sign on again. All right. This will settle. This will be good. All right. Sorry about that. It's all right. I just want to thank everybody that has come listen to the show uh, right now. If you're watching it on YouTube, uh, please subscribe and uh, check it out. And of course, you know, keep your comments going. Uh, I know that uh, Kane, you know, it's one of those things that we're still working with the format as far as like what happens, how long can we uh, live stream before one of our, uh, one of our, live streams and Wi-Fi connection goes weird, but I'm going to put on the girl now that brought this all together. This is Lourdes. Lourdes, hey. what's happening? What's going on? Uh, she, she, by by the way, folks, if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, she's the one, Lourdes, that brought Kane into my world. And uh, I just wanted to thank you for getting Kane booked. I'm going to bring him back for part two, where we talk a little bit more about the business. But yeah. hello, how you doing? I'm good. I wanted to show Kane something. Hey, hey okay. bro. <laughs> hey, am I on screen? Because my thing is. Stuck. I can't I hear you. Here? Yes, you are. You are definitely you on screen, me? and he can hear you, Lourdes. Yeah, can you? Well, he's I, just I can't hear hey, Lourdes. Lourdes what are you doing? <laughs> he's babbling. He's asking you what you're up to. You better, you better ask. Uh, I'm still crying and hiding under my bed. <laughs> <laughs> She's look. crying and hiding under her bed. <laughs> look, look, Kane, look. Who am I? Who am I? Hold on, let's see. Chi, chi, chi. <laughs> ha, ha, ha. Yeah, I know what that is. That sounds like an inside joke between Lourdes and Kane. <laughs> the big brother, little look, sister, I think. Look, 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 look. Remember that? What are you talking oh about? Oh, my God, yeah. <laughs> Wait a second. Yeah. Doesn't it say, doesn't it say Kane Roberts? Ka- I used to, uh, we used to have so many. I can't yes. do this camera, right? But we had a lot of funny sayings. 
And so every day was just absolutely hilarious. He would sing Christmas carols at five o'clock in the morning in the summertime. <laughs> well, hey, now hold on. Christmas carols uh, I can can't be hear sung him. at any time. Is it the Christmas technical carols thing? Christmas carols are great songs. I believe, I believe that the weather outside is, is uh, frightful. <laughs> but the fire is so delightful. Oh, my gosh. And you got no place to go. Let it snow. You know, <laughs> Lord is he's actually singing lyrics to Christmas carols right now, and oh it's April, God. so th maybe it's a good thing you can't hear it right now. But he's not doing it in his sultry, most sultry voice that we know that we he know can. from. No, no, he's got a good voice, but the he's got a great him. voice. Yeah, he he would do a lot of Frank Sinatra. It was the funniest thing. There oh my is. God! Yeah, Lord, the fact that you guys can't hear each other, I'm going to say thank you real quick and take you uh -huh. out. But thank you for getting Kane on the show. I'm going to Kane. Can you hear me? Okay, right now. Are you back? Maybe. It's okay. Are you there? Yes. Christmas, Christmas carols. Anybody? <laughs> I, uh, so what I was going to say, uh, the the the, if I had a message to give to some of your listeners, I'd really love them to go see uh, beginning of the end. Uh, the video I shot with Alice and Alyssa White Glues uh, from Arch Enemy. Um, her, his appearance, I already mentioned. <clears throat> Alyssa's appearance on the video and on the song was I was about to do a guitar solo. And I thought to myself, you know, I, I just don't like, it's part of my being, not being an obeyer, you know, like, like I, don't, I don't like authority, you know, unless it's earned. And, yeah. you know, I was thinking everybody just puts the solo here. And I thought to myself, what would it be like if Alyssa lands in the middle of the video and detonates the whole song? And, you know, if people listen to it, you know, some people don't like that growl thing that uh, she does and what other artists do. But when she starts singing, it's one of the most incredible voices in rock today. So um, uh, she's going to have a, she's going to have a massive future. I just hope everybody, you know, goes to take a look at it. Beginning of the end. Uh, on YouTube uh, with Kane, Alice, and Alyssa. And also the drummer from Baby Metal is on that song, Aoyama Hideki, oh. um, who is one of the most humble guys I've ever met. I, he sent me back the tracks, you know, two or three different takes, and he said, I hope this is okay. And I was going, fuck, man. Thank you, Kitty Oates. <laughs> Thank you. There it is. I'm Shout very out. Happy to like There's it. a lot of people right now that have watched it, and it's good because uh, I. I think Cheryl Cooper's in that video as well, if I'm not mistaken. Oh my I remember God. that day. Cheryl is unbelievable in that video. And you should, by the way, we have a director's cut coming out. Uh, we, we were able, without any time crunch, to get, uh, you know, two or three really talented editors. And the video is now, like, fully cinematic. It's fully going to be cool. So that's going to come out in about a month. Um, and then I'm going to line up my other videos uh, through the rest of the year. So uh, okay, pretty excited I'm about it. But look at I think people will like it. It's very different. I'm definitely going to have you back on where we can talk a little bit more about the business of music and talk about, uh, obviously, the, the, the other videos that you have out and this mystery live stream that you're working on as well. So hopefully by then yes. we will... Yes, the live stream will be out by then. Yes, and we'll talk more about it as well. Um, I honestly, I'm glad that we got our Wi-Fi back, but I don't want to tempt fate, and I want to just say this is part one of Kane Roberts and Ryan Roxy uh, having a nice talk. I mean, it's it's literally the first time we've ever had a ever talked, dude. I want to thank you for the opportunity. This is this is great. This might be one of the best uh, conversations I've had. And next time, I promise to take a shower. By the way, <laughs> 9 a.m. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I'm trying to I'm trying to be a world citizen here. I'm trying because because it's actually wine time here in Sweden, and I'm actually missing yep. out on on some wine time. My wife's going to bring me a little bit of a. We're going to have dinner and wine with with my daughter, and then we're going to have um and it's evening time, but it's morning in the West Coast. And there's a lot of people watching from and listening from Australia as well. So it's already tomorrow for them. So. Cool. Until yep. next time, I want everyone to go follow Kane Roberts on Instagram at uh, at Kane Roberts X, and uh, of course, you can always follow me at Ryan Roxy on Instagram. I appreciate you guys coming, Lourdes. Thank you for bringing us together. Um, the whole team, Vic. I know that you have some work to do with getting the sound and edit editing and all that stuff. We'll try and get a little clip of the new video uh, beginning of the end up there as well. But until next time, Kane, um, 
any parting words that you have for the folks out there? Because I know they're big fans. You know, everybody, uh, you know, stay, stay tight. You know, you're going to get upset about this whole lockdown thing. Uh, it's okay to be upset, you know, just let it out. But, you know, take a, take a chance maybe and, and create something that you think that everybody told you you couldn't make before. And then the other thing is watch my video. So have a great time, everybody. And, and you know, as you can see, just by what I'm doing, I'm, I'm doing this, uh, you know, for, for you guys and to, to be able to communicate with, with everybody and with people like Ryan as well. So uh, rock on. Kane, thanks for coming on live in the trenches, live stream with Ryan Roxy. Uh, we will have another episode up very soon. Go check out uh, the YouTube Roxy TV official channel. But until next time, in the trenches with Ryan Roxy, it's been Kane Roberts on here. Enjoy the ride. In the trenches with Ryan Roxy. That's it.